we put All right, have your attention, please. We're going to get started. So um, we'll finish off a few slides from last time that I didn't make it through after this one. This is just where we left off. And then uh, we'll start today a three series or three lecture series of the topic of cancer, which is um, not to sound macabre, but it's fun to talk about because it's actually a really fascinating biological process. And you know we're all affected by it in some way, right? So if I said to raise your hand, if you know somebody's at cancer, you would all raise your hands. I mean, we all have family, friends, ourselves sometimes that can be affected by this. And uh, it's an important thing, therefore, to learn about um, and an interesting thing to learn about. And in doing so, we'll end up reinforcing a lot of the concepts that we've uh, heard about so far, apoptosis, cell division, signaling pathways, um, signal transduction, all these things, receptors, ligands, they all come together in a process or a series of processes that hopefully helps drive home um, one of the, you know, the, some of the major things I want you to take away from this class. So that's what we'll be doing over the next few lectures. Uh, it tends to be a topic, obviously, of interest to many students, so I encourage you to keep asking questions. We're not going to rush through anything. I've uh, made sure of that, that we have the time to discuss the topic. And as always, I have my candy. So, um, you know, it's something that's uh, an interesting thing. I encourage you to really kind of learn from it. OK, so this is where we left off last time. Uh, we finished talking about apoptosis, the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So I won't go through it again, because you have that in your lecture capture. But this is the last slide we were on last time. What I want to do then to finish off the few slides from last time, the last few are really simple slides just to illustrate a couple of concepts that we've um, talked about a lot. Uh, so extracellular factors that promote organ or organism growth can be divided into three major classes. And the context for this is you know, we talked about cell proliferation, we talked about cell death, and now I'm kind of giving you three major examples of signals that can influence cell proliferation and cell death as well as cell growth. So the first category, if you ever hear the term survival factor, uh, that's what the name sounds like. It's a signal that promotes cell survival. You've already heard about these, right? We've talked about signaling pathways that can encourage or discourage a cell from staying alive or, or encourage a cell to die or something like that. So you've already heard about examples of, of these different categories. So then a survival factor promotes cell survival by suppressing apoptosis. A mitogen, which you've also already heard about, mito for mitosis, a mitogen is a signal that promotes cell proliferation. And then a growth factor is a factor that promotes growth, so growth of a cell as opposed to it dividing. Right? So there's nothing super complicated on this side. It, slide. It's exactly what you would expect. There's, you have a cell. It can do a few basic things. It can divide. It can die. It can grow bigger. These are three categories of signals that control those three things. And that's really all it is. So um, I told you a lot about apoptosis at a molecular level last time and the pathways that cause it to happen. So I want to pull back for a second and tell you about an example of what survival factors can do and how important and they are. It's not, you know, we, apoptosis isn't just about a cell being damaged and dying. You might recall the example of your digit in a mouse embryo and also in us where you have, or your hand, sorry, where you've got the digits that have to be separated out based on apoptosis in between them. The webbing has to go away. That was one example of where cell death is important for development. Here's another example. I think a few weeks ago, somebody in class had asked about a nerve cells dying. And while this figure from your book is kind of terrible, and I'll explain why it's terrible in a second, um, it does illustrate an important point. 
you have here nerve cells that are growing like crazy, dividing. You're making a bunch of nerves, neurons, when you're young. Um, when you're an embryo and even when you're a young child and you're growing and you're developing skills, you're, you're building that network. Well, what actually happens is that in many cases you make more neurons than you need on purpose in a sense, and then you only keep the ones that connect. So here you have neurons that are sending out axons, and these are target cells that are sending out these red dots, signals, that are survival factors. So if a neuron encounters a survival factor, a red dot, secreted by the cell, then it'll stay alive and connect. And if it doesn't see those signals, then they'll die off, as shown here. The reason I say your figure from the book is terrible is that the way they've drawn it, it looks like this cell should be surviving because it's got the red dots next to it. So they really should have drawn it differently where they, you know, there should be red dots near this one that lives and then nothing over here near the one that dies. So the book has just not drawn it properly, but the point is that you have to see survival factors to live. And one example why that's important is the development of your brain and your nervous system. If you don't have this process take place, having too many neurons is a bad thing. And you can actually have a number of uh, health conditions, including mental health conditions, that sometimes have been traced back to having uh, too many neurons in a particular location or not being wired well because of an overproliferation of these cells. So, it's sort of like the Goldilocks idea, you have to get it just right. Too much, too little, you know, are not good things. All right, and so this is just an example of a signaling pathway where you would have a survival factor turning on a receptor. You have a signaling cascade. We've talked about these things. A transcriptional regulator goes to the nucleus, turns on various genes, and so on and so forth. And in this example here, remember we learned about the BCL family of proteins, right? that are important for apoptosis, or, and they can be either pro or anti-apoptotic. So in this case, the example shown is that a survival factor is uh, stimulating the production of BCL2 protein, which in turn blocks apoptosis. And that's in the slides that we covered last time, so you can kind of look at that pathway. So that's, uh, that's survival factors in a very broad, simple uh, sense. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, um, folks talk about nerve cells not being renewed, and does that mean that uh, they're not dividing anymore? So uh, the short answer is, generally speaking, yes. The vast majority of neurons in adults, um, once you, if you lose them, you lose them. You're not going to be able to get them back. However, there are parts of your brain that do have neuronal proliferation, even in adults. And I think we're kind of continuing to learn that there's low levels of division and proliferation in some parts of our nervous system that we simply couldn't detect before. Whether or not it's physiologically relevant is a different question. Um, so if I'm making one new neuron every few weeks, just because that's the basal level, does it matter in terms of my function? It's hard to say. So it gets, you know, when you start looking at it in detail, it gets kind of messy in terms of the answer to that. But the sort of canonical view or the traditional view is that uh, most neurons in your body, once you have them, that's it. And as you get older and you, they start to die off, that can impair our function. Now, there are, outside of the brain, outside of the central nervous system, there are examples of neurons that do actually continue to regenerate. For example, in your nose, you replace these neurons that you smell with once every month to month and a half. A completely brand new set. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Like, you're exposed, your nose is exposed to the environment. Um, many of you have been sick or smelled something and lost your sense of smell for a while. And then you realize about a month later, it's back. It's back because those neurons that got damaged by whatever they encountered and killed them off are being replaced with another set of neurons. But that requires energy. It requires having a, um, a system in place to do that because it makes sense for the organism to do that. It doesn't, evolutionary speaking, evolutionarily speaking, make as much sense for, let's say, a 60-year-old me to replace a few neurons in the brain if I've already served my purpose for procre procreating and raising my kids and so on, right? So, you know, there's... There's cases where neurons can come back, and there's cases when they don't. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So mitogens then, uh, mito for mitosis, stimulate cell division by promoting entry into the S phase. Um, and that's really all I'm going to tell you about that. And we kind of had an example of a mitogen earlier. I just wanted to reemphasize that here. And then growth factors, as the name suggests, are stimulating cells to grow. So again, very simple diagram, a growth factor binding to a receptor, pathways like the ones you've learned about. And then as you would expect, if you want to grow the size of a cell, 
that means you need more stuff inside of it, which means you have to make more proteins and, of course, more lipids, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the, the two, two sort of very broad outcomes with a growth factor is that you're going to make more protein and you're going to reduce the amount of protein you're destroying. And that combination will make more protein be present. And that's really all this is meant to illustrate. Now, why would you need cells of different sizes? This is a nice example of your book. I mean, from, of your book. From your book, these cells are to scale. So this is a liver cell. This is 25 micrometers here. Uh, to remind you, a meter has 1,000 millimeters. A millimeter has 1,000 micrometers. Uh, the average cell in us is roughly 10 micrometers across with a huge standard deviation. Um, so a liver cell here is, uh, looks like, based on the scale bar, probably about 20 micrometers wide or so. And then look at how huge this neuron is. Its cell body is up here, and it's got all these projections coming out. So to be this big and to send proteins all the way down here, you have to have a lot of growth factors telling you to grow. So that's a nice example of why you have to have growth factors. OK, um, and so this is just a very sort of simple statement that these signals can inhibit cell survival, division, or growth. That's what we covered uh, to a large extent uh, in the last lecture slash this lecture. And I'll end that, those series of slides with a really interesting example from your book. There's a protein called myostatin. Myo for muscle, statin for like stop or don't do anything. Myostatin inhibits muscle growth. And it's an important part of regulating, again, Goldilocks' idea. Too much, too little, not a good thing. So myostatin helps keep the right amount of muscle that you need uh, present uh, in your body. Um, a long time ago, folks who breed cattle realized, huh, if we want more meat, maybe I could uh, use, use cattle that are, um, seem to be more muscular and maybe I'll breed those. And so we do this all the time, right? We breed corn, we breed tomatoes, we breed cattle. We've been doing quote unquote genetic engineering for thousands of years. Next time somebody tells you GMO is bad for you, explain to them that GMO doesn't, that's a, we'll cover that at the end of class. <laughs> Don't get me started on pseudoscience. So basically, we've been manipulating genomes for thousands of years by breeding things together. Um, and in the case of the cattle I'm going to show you, these are cattle that have mutations in the gene myostatin, which leaves them extra muscular. These are Belgian blue cattle. Um, and they, are, they have a mutation in the protein myostatin. So this would be a protein that would be inhibiting muscle growth, and it's not working. And now these cattle will get really mus muscular. And this is a mouse, a normal mouse uh, in a lab, where you can see it's muscular tissue. And then somebody made a, a mutation in the myostatin gene, and you can see how much more muscular it gets. This, of course, might make you start thinking about all sorts of ethical issues down the road in terms of genetic engineering and human beings, athletes wanting to get stronger. You know, again, we'll talk a little bit about those things when we finish class with a stem cells lecture, but uh, food for thought, if you will. OK, I'm going to skip this slide because it was the ending teaser slide. And of course, we're, we're not in last class. We're in this class. It's very uh, metaphysical of me to say, I guess. So we'll come back to this slide when I, as I'm talking through um, the cancer slides. I'm going to talk about elephants, which might seem weird, but it's going to be really cool when we get to it. All right, so now I'm going to pull up today's lecture slides. And you may have noticed that the, there's a huge slide stack here. It's for three different lectures today, the next one, and the one after that. So the idea is to just go through these slides um, in a manner that's not rushed, and we'll get through whatever we get through. And that's why it's one big bundle of slides on the topic cancer. Any questions before I dive into these slides? All right. All right, so obviously I'll skip the previously on the hit show stuff because you just heard that. Although this is a reminder, your cheat sheet for the lecture I just finished off from last time, all the things that you need to uh, be aware of. All right, so cancer, AKA how cells rebel against the rules from the previous lectures. If you want the simplest way to think about cancer, to me this is it. That all the things I've tried to teach you um, regulatory pathways, checkpoints, apoptosis promotion when things are bad. All these things that keep you healthy, that keep your cells in good shape or kill off the cells when they're not uh, healthy cells or if they're no longer useful, those things are things that cancer learns how to ignore. By rebelling against those, those, that structure, stepping outside of it and growing like crazy. So that's a very straightforward way to think about cancer. Uh, and it really, you know, 
Um, you can impress people when you talk to non-biologists and they ask you what is cancer, you can just tell them this. It's actually just good cells gone bad. That really is what it is. Um, this long list is your uh, list of learning objectives and questions to answer for these, for these slides for cancer. So I won't read them to you, but again, as before, this is your study guide for what you really need to understand for your exams. Uh, and then, of course, there's a bunch of other information for those of you who are really interested in the topic. So I'll start off um, cancer by showing you a couple of videos uh, that kind of are in other people's words. Uh, what is cancer and why should we be studying it? is cancer. Contrary to what many people believe, cancer isn't just one disease. There are more than 100 common types of cancer and many more subtypes which can occur anywhere in the body. Sarcomas are cancers that originate in muscle, fibrous tissue or fat known as soft tissue sarcomas or in bone and cartilage. Leukemias are cancers of the blood cells, arising in the blood-forming organs, bone marrow, and the spleen. Lymphomas affect the lymphatic system, a network of vessels and nodes that acts as the body's filter. There are at least 30, and perhaps more, different types of lymphomas. Carcinomas, the most common cancers, arise in the body's organs. About 80% of all cancers are carcinomas. Examples are cancers of the breast, prostate, stomach, colon, and as the skin is an organ, also include squamous and basal cell skin cancers. There are a few cancers that don't fit into these major categories. Melanomas, for example, are not considered carcinomas, even though they arise from skin cells and certain types of brain tumors have their own classification. Cancer begins in the body's cells. All parts of the body, organs, muscles, skin, even bones and blood, are composed of cells. Cells are constantly dividing and multiplying to replace old cells. Dividing is part of a normal cell's lifespan. Cells grow, divide, and die in an orderly fashion. However, if this orderly process is interrupted and cells begin to grow out of control, they form excess tissue known as a tumor. In most cases, tumors are benign, meaning that they are not cancerous. Benign tumors can occur almost anywhere. Although they may cause some health problems depending on their size and location and may have to be removed, they are usually not life-threatening. However, if cells are cancer cells, they grow, divide, and eventually form malignant tumors. Malignant tumors, unlike benign tumors, invade and destroy surrounding tissues and nearby organs. Eventually, cancer cells break off and spread through the blood or lymphatic system to form new tumors in other parts of the body. This process, the spread of cancer from its original site, is known as metastasis. Cancers that originate in the breast or colon, for example, typically metastasize to the brain, lung, liver, or bone, forming new tumors there. Metastasis can be a slow process, occurring over a number of years, or can happen rapidly, within a few weeks. Scientists are not sure why. Left untreated, cancers continue to grow, invade, and spread taking over and destroying the organs where they originate, as well as those to which they spread and metastasize. As this happens, the person will eventually begin to experience symptoms related to the organs affected. 
To understand what causes cancer to occur, we must look deeper into the cell, at the genes that control the cell's growth and behavior, and how the cell's normal function may be disrupted or damaged. Since it is the genes that regulate the normal orderly behavior of cells, abnormalities or damage to cells genetic components cause them to behave abnormally, to become cancers. In some cases, people have inherited genes that may predispose them to cancer, while in other cases, genes are damaged by external environmental factors, such as smoking, exposure to chemicals or ultraviolet radiation, and perhaps even viruses. Not all of the causes of genetic cell damage and in many cases it's probably not one but a combination of factors. There are still many unknowns. Research has unraveled many of cancer and new discoveries are happening every day. The more we learn about cancer, the more targeted and specialized our therapies are becoming. There was a time not too long ago when a diagnosis of cancer was perhaps the worst medical news you could receive. But today, if you or someone you love has cancer, it's important to remember that many cancers that were once fatal are now curable and many more are treatable than ever before in history. So a number of points there that we'll cover in more detail about benign versus malignant, what's metastasis. These are some of the things we'll talk about in the next few lectures. But notice you know, immediately how different this is from most diseases. It's not a virus infecting a cell. It's not a bacterium. It's not um, you know, an injury that you had happen to you. It's cells growing out of control and then going to other places and inhibiting the function of other cells that are there. So if I have a metastasis that ends up in my lungs and I'm not able to breathe because of it, that's really what causes the problem, not so much you know, the original growth of the tumor. So it's kind of an interesting disease to think about. All right, here's a shorter video. Normal human breast epithelial cells can be grown in cell culture. And I, they I should show, say, I want to show you this one because, like, when I was your age, I didn't really know what cancer looked like. What does it really look like to have a cell that's cancerous? And so it's kind of nice to be able to look at it and say, oh, that's the difference between a, a normal cell behaving and a, a cancer cell behaving. So that's what this video will show you with breast cancer cells in a dish. Oops. Normal human breast epithelial cells can be grown in cell culture. They form structures that resemble the little sacs of cells from which the mammary gland is built. Cells assemble into a well-organized, polarized epithelium that forms a closed sphere with an internal lumen. In the mammary gland, this space would be connected to ducts, and the cells would secrete milk into it. By contrast, these human breast cancer cells grown under the same conditions divide aggressively and in an uncontrolled fashion. They are also more migratory and grow organized clumps which would form tumors in the body. So pretty big differences there in behavior, as you can see. All right, so let's talk about some of the basics that have already been covered a little bit in the videos. So cancer, here in red, this is sort of the, really the main point. It's a disease caused by uncontrolled cell proliferation and even differentiation. Cells growing out of control. If you don't have that, you can't have cancer. Tumors then, just, you know, we're going to go through a few defini definitions here. Tumors are masses of tissue that result from this uncontrolled cell proliferation. In other words, if I have a bump growing, let's say, on my arm that shouldn't be there, that is technically a tumor. It's, un it's, it's a mass of tissue that wasn't supposed to be there as a result of uncontrolled proliferation. And we, as you get older, people do have those growths that take place. Usually they're benign, they're not a problem. Um, sometimes they just stay there and maybe sometimes they go away. Other times if they get big and they can be an issue, they are surgically removed. But these are benign tumors. They're tumors that are there, but they're not cancer. Right? So there's two, and this, uh, we'll come back to the cell cycle. That's why this is here to remind you that we're talking about cell proliferation, which uses the cell cycle. There are two types of tumor then, benign and malignant. 
As that first video mentioned, benign tumors are not cancer. So a tumor is not cancer, but it can become cancer. So benign tumor is one where you've had a mass grow, the cells are there, they're not supposed to be there, but they're not doing anything much beyond that. A malignant tumor is one that is cancerous. And a malignant cancerous tumor is cancerous because those cells have now evolved the ability to, remove, to escape from that original spot and spread to other locations and cause harm. So it's really a very simple physical difference. You know, it's not as if a malignant cancer um, you know, evolved superpowers or something, it, it, or although in a sense it did, it evolved the ability to move away or mutated itself and evolved the ability to move away from the original cancer. But that's really the only difference. Benign are not cancerous and malignant cells are and they can go elsewhere and cause problems. These are uh, three of the major categories. The video touched on, I think, five or so categories, uh, which are um, here in this next slide. But these are the three major ones. The vast majority of cancers are carcinomas. Uh, examples include lung cancer, breast, and colon cancer, arising from epithelial cells in all those cases. Now, that's not a coincidence, if you will. Um, epithelial cells are highly proliferative cells. You know, just like the ones on your skin, you're constantly growing new skin cells and shedding them. When you have lots of cell division, when you have cells that are turning over, now you're at higher risk of getting mutations in that process that could end up causing you cancer. Don't have to, but it's possible. So that's why you end up having most cancers in these highly proliferative cells. If you're not dividing much, you're not going to have an easy way to become cancerous. Sarcomas arise from supporting tissues, bone, fat, cartilage, etc. Lymphomas and leukemias arise from blood and lymph cells. So lymphomas come from lymph cells in your lymphatic system, and then leukemias are cancers in the blood. So these are a little bit unique because they're not solid tissues. They're actually in your blood, and they're sort of cancerous cells that are proliferating and going throughout your, your circulatory system. So they're a bit unique that way. All right, so then these are the three, or sorry, the five main groups, so three of them Carcinoma, sarcomas, lymphomas I just covered. Well, actually, what they've done here is they divided lymphomas and leukemias in the different things. So that's four we talked about. And then myelomas we didn't cover, but that's another uh, a fifth category. And shown over here are examples of where you're going to find common carcinomas. So these are some of those tissues. Leukemias in the bloodstream, lymphomas in the lymph nodes, and then some, some common sarcomas are shown here. So same information, just to shown to you a little bit of a different way. These are the common cancers that we're usually aware of. Now there are others, as that first video mentioned. You have brain tumors, um, there's childhood cancers like neuroblastoma, which we study in my lab. So there are other cancer types out there, but these are the major groups right here. So um, this graph is quite stark, right? It, it really illustrates what cancer is, the disease of getting old. Uh, so on the y-axis here, is the incidence rate of cancer per 100,000 people. Uh, so for example, there's almost no cancer in kids, which thankfully, is, is a, that's great, right? But as you get older, you know, let's say at age 60 or so, about 60 people per 100,000 will, will exhibit cancer. And you can see how quickly that rate of cancer goes up the older you get. So at my age, right about here, I already have a significantly higher you know, rate of risk of cancer than you do at your age right about probably here. So it really is a disease of getting older as you accumulate mutations that can put you at risk of cancer. Now, at this point, I often like to ask this question just for fun. Any thoughts on the evolution of the human species as relates to this graph? Anything that comes to mind? Any questions? Any comments? Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, no, well, I'm no, I'm not. I'm not asking about the foods you eat. I'm asking about us. So, like, why, why would it be okay to get cancer when you're so old, basically? Because you're done reproducing. You're done reproducing, and I mean that's reproduction is only part of it, right? You have to raise your kids too, but uh, you think about when fertility happens in human beings, particularly if you go back thousands of years, caveman days, whatever you want to call it, you know, prehistoric days. Um, if you're having a kid at age 15, let's say, and you're a grandparent by age 30, a great-grandparent by age 45, you know, I'm just making this up, but you get the idea. Why would you need to live to be 60, 70, 80 years old? You're a burden on your community if you're living in a cave somewhere. Uh, so there really hasn't been a lot of evolutionary pressure 
for us to maintain or fight off cancer at these later ages. It's only relatively recently in human history that we live long enough to, for this to matter. In other words, I was talking to somebody in office hours about this, you know, why do we die of cancer? If you don't die of anything else, you will probably at some point die of cancer because it's a disease of get your cells getting old, mutations accumulating, and your ability to correct those mutations decreasing. So it's sort of just getting old in most cases. Sometimes you get unlucky and you get cancer when you're younger. But really the idea is that we haven't evolved very good natural mechanisms to stop us from getting cancer at this point. We're not useful for the propagation of our DNA. All right, something to think about. Any questions about this big picture? Yes. Why is cancer more common now? So that's a very good question that we will actually cover indirectly a little bit later. But to answer your question now, um, it's uh, sort of what I was just saying. Um, if, let's say, I, you know, hypothetically, I had some heart condition that would have 100 years ago killed me at age 35 or something like that, and let's also say I was predisposed to getting a cancer that would have hit me when I was 60, uh, if I was dying of the heart condition, I would never have known it wouldn't have mattered that I would have gotten cancer at age 60, uh, right? Because I would have been done. But now we have so many uh, medicines and, and technological solutions and better eating and better living that more people are living longer. And as you live longer, you're going to be more at risk for getting various other diseases, whether it's cancer or heart disease or something else. So that's part of it. Um, the actual rates of cancers when you adjust for just you know the fact that we're doing better in that sense, uh, cancer rates are actually going down because we're doing a better job of finding treatments and new technologies and new approaches to fight cancer off. So there's actually been a reduction in, in, in many cancers, but it's not, it's going to take some time and a lot of hard work and to really try to eradicate most of these major ones. And at some point, we all have to die of something. So there's that aspect of it too. So, all right. Yes. Two questions. Somebody go ahead. <laughs> One more time. Like from the graph, I realized that um, from three to ten years ago, we have like almost no problems of getting cancer. Right. But then now we have that. Like, why is it like that? Are, are you saying why do we have that now where some kids are getting cancer? Well, this is, so this is probability, right? So um, if, if down there at age 10, five kids out of 100,000 are, get, are getting cancer, that's still five kids, right? So the incidence is very low, but it does happen. Um, in kids, most of the time, cancers are, have a hereditary component. So sometimes um, one of the cancers we'll talk about later is retinoblastoma in the eye. And that one is quite common if you inherited a mutated copy of retinoblastoma from your parents. That puts you at higher risk of your second copy being mutated. Uh, so that's rare. Like, it's not like a bunch of kids are all getting retinoblastoma. But that's an example of where a hereditary mutation puts you at increased risk of cancer. And in other cases, um, you know, it's just bad luck or a variety of different things or environmental um, contributors. So, you know, if you, let, so let's say when the Chernobyl disaster happened, for example, in Russia, if you lived close by and you were subjected to a lot of radiation and had a lot of mutations, then your kids are going to be at higher risk of cancer, right? So, yes. Yeah, please. Um, oh, I did? Okay. Uh, say it one more time. Ah, um, yeah. So the question is, the mutation that's passed down, let's say, in somebody's gene that puts you at risk for cancer, could you remove that with gene editing? Um, <laughs> so the short answer is, in theory, yes. Uh, you, we will. You heard from Shivakshan about CRISPR-Cas9 that's a, a really hot topic right now, a gene editing tool that's being used in labs all over. And as you may, I think he probably talked about it very controversially. This guy in China decided to go off the rails and do an experiment in humans. Um, the details of that remain fuzzy. He basically disappeared. The government kind of disappeared him. 
Um, and as far as we can tell, and when I say we, I mean the scientific community, he may actually have done something. I think he did. Um, highly unethical, obviously, and we'll find out what the consequences of that are. But of, from a more ethical perspective of what we are doing in science, we want to make sure that any editing that gets applied to help humans, which is coming and you know can happen, um, needs to be carefully vetted first because you have unintended consequences. So for example, CRISPR-Cas9, that gene editing system is known to have off-target effects. So what if I'm trying to help somebody by getting rid of that mutation that causes cancer, but I accidentally end up chopping up other things in their DNA? Now what happens next? So you want to understand these things before you go to that very serious step of helping folks out with it. Um, there are other examples of gene editing that have been used in humans in very specific cases. So uh, cystic fibrosis, fibrosis, for example, is caused by a single mutation. And there have been many attempts. I think some of them have started to be successful now for using gene therapy to try and fix that. So there's a lot of potential to do good here. And we're in the middle of watching that happen. But when it comes to cancer, it gets even trickier because cancer is not due to a single mutation. It's actually due to the accumulation of many mutations, which we'll talk about. Um, so the idea of fixing all those mutations is a much bigger task, and, and I think is, we're far, far away from that. Yeah. Yes? <coughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. You guys should come sit further up here. I mean, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. So how do uh, carcinogens, and you gave the example of dichloromethane, cause cancer? Um, we'll get to that as well very briefly, but the idea is that carcinogens are compounds, natural or, or not, that have the ability to mutate your DNA to cause cancer. And there is a very clear distinction between a mutagen and a carcinogen, which I'll talk about. A mutagen is anything that can cause a mutation, but not all mutations cause cancer. Furthermore, um, not all compounds that are mutagens are dangerous. So for example, we use something in science labs, uh, scientific labs all over called ethidium bromide that labels DNA. Uh, we run it in gels, and it's bright red, and it's got a big skull and crossbones on the bottle, and so people freak out about it all the time. Ethidium bromide is a mutagen and can and will mutate your DNA if you drank it, right? So you shouldn't do that. But what most people don't know is ethidium bromide can't penetrate your skin. So if I dump a bunch on my skin, and mutate the DNA in my skin cells, which are going to slough off any day anyway, who cares? Right? So there's a difference between a mutagen, which is something that can mutate DNA, and a carcinogen, which has been shown to actually cause cancer based on mutating DNA. So the chemical you mentioned is considered a carcinogen because it's been established that if you are exposed to it for too much or too long or whatever, that it can cause cancer. And that's why it's called a carcinogen. I'm listening, sorry, I'm just going to close this. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So the question is, um, the incidence of cancer, uh, cancer in women versus men, is it higher in one than the other related to fertility and, and when the fertility is there? Um, I think that's a tricky question. I don't, to my knowledge, there's not a direct relationship there. Uh, there's environmental and other factors that override it. So uh, as an example, I'll get to eventually in the slides. When smoking first took off in the, in the US in the mid-1900s, uh, men got cancer a lot more because at that point in time, the, ironically enough, the fact that women didn't have equal rights kept them in the house and they weren't going out and smoking. And so men were developing lung cancer because they were out in bars smoking all the time. And then the women's liberation movement hit and all of a sudden you look at the graphs and 20 years later women started getting lung cancer in, in high numbers because they got out of the house and were now out there working, going to bars, socializing, which of course is a great thing, but like now they're exposed to the toxins that they weren't exposed to before. So there's all these other factors, societal, environmental, um, the food you eat, the, what you do, also just luck that I think override any differences 
that maybe there are between males and females. Now it's true that certain cancers probably do strike men and women differently. Our physiology is different. We have different levels of different hormones. Um, and without getting too off topic, you know, you can, uh, if you're having kids or not having kids, if you have had a hysterectomy or not, you know, these are different factors that can change your hormonal levels and can sometimes put you at higher risk for certain things or lower risk depending on what you're talking about. So it's pretty complicated. Um, so that's sort of the, yeah, it's, it's messy. Yeah. Yes? So cancer is not striking earlier and earlier. It, no, I mean, it's, it's, if the idea is we're, we're living longer, so more people are getting cancer, but I, I wouldn't say that cancer is striking people earlier. I don't think that's, I don't think there's evidence for that, yeah. So. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're referring to probably the BRCA one and two genes. What the? This semester has been fun. <laughs> All right. Well, class dismissed, I guess. <laughs>